Good afternoon and welcome to the COVID-19 Learning Community event hosted by the COVID-19 Command Center and powered by the Joint Information Center. By default, all participants will be muted to minimize distractions. For quality assurance purposes, this meeting will be recorded in its entirety. When we come to our Q&A section after our presentations, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. When called on, please unmute your microphone to ask your question and re-mute your microphone when not speaking to minimize background noise. When speaking, please announce yourself and speak slowly. You can also enter your questions or comments into the chat panel. Our meeting objectives today are to review the current state of the SF pandemic and local indicators, including hospital capacity, the, the, the disease situation and disease control. To share the calendar of community testing events, to describe the latest evidence we have about the protection of masks and face coverings, to explore how community providers can partner with communities to support universal masking to help SF bend the curve. Our agenda today will be as follows. Joffrey Morris will be doing our welcome and housekeeping, introducing Dr. Fuchs and Dr. Gandhi. Dr. Fuchs will be leading a presentation of the COVID-19 SF status update and testing calendar. Dr. Gandhi will go over what we do know about how we can support universal masking. And then at this time, we will be doing a, a Q&A, which will be facilitated by Jeffrey Morris. Jeffrey, if you want to take us away, it's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today is a very, very exciting um, day. Not only will we be providing you uh, community testing updates, we have Dr. Gandhi here to share um, this important information. That is important that everyone on here um, who represents community can share. And I wanted to just let community know that these Friday meetings, we are continuing to adapt um, the Friday community test meetings um, to further develop our transparency and how we receive information and share back to community. Um, we're always open for feedbacks and I'll um, also put my email in the chat. We tried a different format this week and then sometimes the format will change like this week is only one meeting because of the data that we have on masking that will come a little later. But uh, sit back, it is gonna be a great hour of your time. Thank you, Dr. Fuchs. Really excited to have uh, Dr. Monica Gandhi join us. Uh, she's a professor of medicine uh, at uh, UCSF. She leads our Ward 86. Um, HIV care program at uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, and she's the director of the Center for AIDS Research um, at uh, UCSF. And she's uh, turned a lot of her attention over the past several months in the context of the pandemic about prevention strategies for uh, COVID-19, and we're really thrilled to have her here to join us and share the latest data and synthesis of what we know about masking as a way to try to prevent uh, new transmission. So, Dr. Gandhi, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on this call. I'm just going to actually show you some slides as we talk about uh, masking today. And uh, I really want to start with um, some new ideas that are emerging about masking, but probably um, overall a very important role in, um, the, in controlling this pandemic. So, we're going to talk about before we launch into the, what I think is new data on the third reason why facial masking is important, we're going to talk about the first two reasons to facially mask. Then we're going to, when we talk about the third reason, I really want to talk about um, driving up the proportion of infections that are asymptomatic and the possibility of doing that with facial masking. We'll go over the, the data behind that and sort of the history of why we think getting in less of a viral inoculum or dose 
because you're wearing a mask um, would be associated with less severe disease or not having symptoms at all. And then um, we'll talk about some hopeful instances of what asymptomatic infection means because asymptomatic infection is a problem because you can spread it even when you have um, no symptoms. So, but there's some good things about it too, which is just having no symptoms. So we'll talk about that. So, you know, um, the CDC put out data uh, or recommendations on April 3rd um, about covering the nose and mouth with, with any sort of facial covering. And the way um, to, for, for COVID-19, and the way they put it is they said to protect others. And it was an interesting um, statement just because in other respiratory viruses, like influenza um, and all the data on masking before, it is protective for yourself to wear a mask over your nose and mouth. Um, but they put it out as this statement because there was a lot of data going around in March that even if you felt well, you could have high rates of shedding from, of the virus from your nose and mouth even when you feel fine. And because of that, to cover that up would definitely protect others. And that is one utility. But um, not only data from this epidemic, but also just from the literature in general and just how we've always thought about viruses is that covering the biggest place where um, virus enters your nose and mouth is a good thing. Um, and, um, uh, and it protects you. I mean, there's just no other place that it really enters um, mainly. And so, um, so I maybe you already went over that the, the message will be updated in San Francisco because this is a city that's often ahead of the game um, to protect yourself and others. And I think it really does protect you from getting infection. For example, um, this picture on the left is a picture from hospital systems in Boston where they, um, we all decided across all the hospitals in this, in this city, in this country, to do universal masking um, at the, in mid-March. And so meaning you couldn't come into the hospital and you wear a mask all day. And um, before that, the, in the pink line, you could see that healthcare workers were getting infected. And then after the universal masking policy, healthcare workers stopped getting infected. What? Um, what? And, Oh, sorry. And then another, um, and then another uh, kind of intriguing um, article was this one from um, the CDC MMWR, where a hairstylist in Missouri. There were actually two of them. They were both masked, and their customers were all masked, but they both actively had COVID infection. Um, and none of their clients that they exposed, because um, everyone was wearing masks, got symptoms. They actually, it was 139 clients that got exposed and they only tested 67, maybe the others didn't agree. So none of the others got symptoms and 67 were negative. And so um, it was these kind of articles coming together that led the CDC director on July 4th to say, if we all wore masks, widespread mask wearing could, you know, get this pandemic under control in this country. And we have had an uneven response to masking in this country um, and not all places in the, in the country behave uh, similarly. And uh, it's been more uneven um, in general than any place um, where people have national, uh, national mask mandates and fines and lots of things, but this country has been unusual. So then if we go into the second stage of, okay, well, what is the other thing that a mask does for you? If you think about COVID-19, we actually want to do two things. We want to stop transmission, decrease it at least, and then we want to decrease how sick people get. And um, so we want to actually drive up rates of asymptomatic infection because the bizarre part about this virus is that even though some people absolutely get very, very sick, um, there are so many people who feel completely well. And there's, it's a very you know, protein, um, it causes really massive clinical manifestations. I don't think there's any virus like this, which like a huge proportion of the population is perfectly fine. And then some people can get super sick. And so it is that question that how do we drive up rates of feeling fine if you get the virus? And in fact, every vaccine trial has a, as a secondary outcome, um, driving up rates of people uh, with asymptomatic infection or mild disease. So it is a goal of our COVID efforts. So if we want to ask about driving up the rates of asymptomatic infection, the first question is, what is the typical rate? What, what, do, we, what, is, what do we estimate right now, the percentage of people who don't have any symptoms from COVID when they get COVID? And you'd have to do a really good campaign like the one that um, 
the DPH and UCSF did in the Mission District, where you actually kind of test everyone, no matter if they have symptoms or not, and then follow them out for two weeks, because importantly, you want to make sure they don't get symptoms. And in that study, the Unidescent Salute campaign, um, the rate of asymptomatic infection was 42%. And then a bunch of studies that were kind of well done look, at, look around the same percentage. So the CDC said on July 10th that the rate of asymptomatic infection, not having symptoms, with COVID-19 is 40%. Um, and I think that's about right based on these other studies. So then the question is, can you drive up those rates of asymptomatic infection, more people, people feeling well or having mild infection with masking? That is the question. Um, and why would that even be, by the way? Well, it's because masking filters out viral particles for the wear. So depending on the mask, masks filter out um, the majority of viral particles for the wear. An N95, true enough, would, um, would filter probably 90 to 95% of the virus out, um, but that's very uncomfortable. Um, it's, they've been recommended to be preserved for healthcare workers and you can't wear them all day. We really need to get used, when we say universal masking, we need to get used to wearing a mask all day. And even um, the surgical masks or cloth masks, these really are uh, masks that filter out the majority of viral particles. Maybe not all, though. And that's the question. You get in very little of the virus because you're wearing a mask. Will you get less sick? Um, and that is the question that I'm going to try to talk about in the next couple of slides. So um, really what we did in our research group and others have been doing is looking at the evidence for that. Because the problem is that you can't actually take humans and have them wear cloth masks or sur surgical masks and then spray this SARS-CoV-2 virus on them because that, that would be the ultimate experiment, but that would be unethical, right? So we have to gather evidence from animal experiments and other experiments. So basically there are three major lines of evidence that we're, that we're seeing that look like masks um, decrease your likelihood of getting a severe disease. And I'm gonna call it virologic evidence. And then the middle one is outbreak evidence, evidence from what's going on with outbreaks. And then the third is ecologic evidence, kind of country level data. So when we talk about the virologic evidence, there's actually been data uh, for many years, actually this is a paper from 1938, that the more virus you get into your system, the more likely you are to get sick. So this is animal models. And this was actually a study that um, quantified something called the LD50 of the virus, or the lethal dose 50 of the virus, which means um, the viral dose at which 50% of animals die. So we don't wanna calculate LD50 for this, um, virus, but this concept has been in many animal models. There's like hundreds of articles of the more virus you get in, the more likely you are to get sick. Now, we don't do that with people very often, but this was a study that was published um, five years ago in Clinical Infectious Diseases, which was a study with a more mild virus, a wild type influenza A. And they were planning for, for a vaccine, so they gave human volunteers influenza A. And the more influenza A you got in, the more likely you were to get sick, cough, shortness of breath. And before that, people were, uh, when they had a low amount of virus, they didn't get very sick. They signed a consent. Um, so that is really, um, you know, sort of human evidence, of course, that the more you get in, the more likely you are to get sick. And then um, what we've seen with this particular virus is there was a really, the, the COVID viruses, there was a really nice study also published in the same journal that um, these two Swiss Switzerland cohorts, these were soldiers, and this was kind of right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and one cohort didn't um, distance at all. They were right next to each other, and there was 30% illness in that cohort. And then the other cohort um, either stayed away from each other or wore a mask. It was either or. If they were close to each other, they wore a mask, um, or they stayed six feet apart, and there was 0% illness in that um, particular cohort. So, um, so it's an interesting and sort of has been seen multiple times that this idea that the more inoculum you get and the more likely you're going to be sick. This was actually an interesting reanalysis of the data from the influenza pandemic in 1918 with the second wave of infection, which you can see on the right side on that panel. Because usually the second wave of an infection, people get less sick because they may not have total immunity, but they have some immunity. And usually people have um, less severe illness. 
but this was an unusual pattern that we saw with influenza in 1918 that people got more sick on the second wave and the postulation was that that was 1918 there was a lot of going on there was world war one and there was a lot of overcrowding um, in the second wave just in terms of the timing of when it happened and then it kind of makes sense of what's going on with this particular virus because before we were masking Healthcare workers got a lot more sick. There were more deaths in Wuhan, unfortunately. Um, and um, so did household contacts where people aren't masking, they would get more sick. And so it really, um, Italy and, and New York, this is before we, we understood how important masking was, and there was a lot more severe illness. And then finally, has there been any animal data that says, okay, but you told me about a bunch of other viruses, have you proven this with SARS-CoV-2? the virus that causes COVID. Well, this was a hamster model. So again, we're not gonna do this in humans, but this was a hamster model where hamsters got SARS-CoV-2 and the more they got, um, the more sick they got. They got really sad little CT scans that showed that they were really sick. Um, and the less they got, they didn't get very sick. Um, and then this is a, another hamster model that said, okay, we'll do masks, then reduce that dose. And again, this was another hamster model where that. Hamsters weren't given these tiny little masks, but it was kind of the same thing. They put them in, they put them in cages and they simulated masking. And um, so the, the hamsters that were masked when they piped in the virus, um, they were not only less likely to get it, but they actually were very, they had very mild disease. They, when they had the masks on, they didn't get sick. So there's a lot of kind of what we call virologic evidence, right? For why a mask would help you have less virus in and get less sick. Um, and then the second question, we'll come back to immunity, is, okay, have we seen that in outbreak settings where people were masked? And we have, actually. This is a sort of an interesting, we call this the tale of two cruise ships. But at the beginning of the, the cruise ships are kind of nice examples because people aren't coming in and out. They're really closed settings and they're kind of like, kind of like experimental settings. And at the very beginning of the pandemic, you remember the Diamond Princess cruise ship. And people didn't know the importance of masking and the rate of asymptomatic infection calculated in that cruise ship outbreak was 18%. And then this other cruise ship that was about a month later, um, this was an Argentinian cruise ship, uh, and this is published in this journal here. Um, they had an outbreak on ship, they had infections, um, and they didn't let them disembark uh, actually either, but they um, gave everyone masks. So they maybe they threw them overboard, but they gave everyone masks. So they gave all the staff and 95s, they gave all the um, passengers surgical masks. And then a lot of people got infected actually, but the rate of asymptomatic infection not having symptoms was 81%. So really much higher than that 40% that's estimated in routine settings. And this has been seen in other settings. There was a pediatric hemodialysis unit in Indiana where people um, converted to uh, SARS-CoV-2, but everyone was wearing masks and no one got sick. And then um, there were two food processing plant outbreaks in this country that were quite large. One was in Oregon in a seafood processing plant, one was in Arkansas in a chicken, Tyson chicken processing plant. And both companies, because they were considered essential work and they were, they were asked to work, they were um, masking their, their, they were actually providing masks to their, you couldn't enter without being given a surgical mask. And um, uh, you had to wear masks all day when you were working. And um, there was big outbreaks, actually there was 500 people or so infected in the Tyson outbreak, but 95% of people were asymptomatic. So it really seems to drive up that rate of asymptomatic infection. And then finally, just country level data, um, it, this also has been playing out. So places that were really used to masking because of SARS, the beginning, uh, the first SARS in 2003, so this would be Hong Kong and Thailand and Singapore and, um, Vietnam and South Korea, uh, they will have cases when they open up, but they've had really, really low death rates. Because when you open up and people are around each other, and we saw that you know, here in San Francisco, I mean, they, it's a very contagious virus, actually, people do get it. But the death rate was very, um, has been very low in those countries. And then I always point to the Czech Republic because they didn't experience SARS in 2003, but they mandated that their populace wear masks starting March 23rd, which was pretty early and it was a true mandate. Um, and same thing with them, they'd open up, they'd get little spikes of infection, they'd go down, they'd come up, but they had a really low severe illness rate. And it was about, um, they've only had 352 deaths and they're pretty much through it. They said, you can um, take off your mask on May 11th and they're doing great. 
Um, and this is a model that shows that um, if you lift lockdown, that you keep on social distancing, that's the gray line, you'll still get, without masks, you'll still get deaths. Um, but with those masks, if you could keep 80% masking rate, which is, which is not, you know, a lot of places in this country, but if you could keep 80% masking rate, you could really keep your deaths low. And even with 50% masks, you're gonna get some deaths, but it's, so you kind of need a high rate of, of compliance in the country or in the region um, uh, to get these low death rates. And then, you know, speculative, hard to understand all of the features of the San Francisco pandemic, but it is notable that when Jonathan said um, that we've been getting more cases, um, and like, let's look back to June 27th. That was a day when we had 3,500 cases and 50 deaths. And now we've had, you know, um, 6,000 more cases um, or so. Uh, and we've had only 23 more deaths. We have a total of 83 deaths. So our case fatality rate is very, very low in the city of San Francisco. And how much do we mask? I would venture to say we are a relatively good population in terms of masking. No one knows the exact proportion. No one's counted from a helicopter, but, um, and you know, it, it depends on who's masking and it also depends on essential workspaces. I think giving out masks, because I think it's it been shown in every um, country that if you hand someone a mask, there's like something about that that makes a difference. Um, and, uh, and, you know, um, but the idea is that uh, we've, we have been very fortunate in having a very low death rate in San Francisco. Um, and then I will end uh, with, is asymptomatic infection horrible then? Um, because wouldn't you want to drive up the rates? Well, yeah, so there is something horrible about it, by the way, which is that, right, like the entire issue is that you can spread virus even when you feel well. That's weird. That's not influenza. That's not the first SARS. That's why we wear masks. That's why we don't be are asked to wear masks every winter because of influenza. Um, but the on the other hand, wearing a mask also helps you know prevents it from getting to others. So that helps um, helps others. And the hopeful thing would be is that if we drive up the rate of asymptomatic infection, can you get immunity? if you've had asymptomatic infection. And I will say that, you know, there have been a couple of case reports of reinfection this week. It's very rare, um, uh, or at least it's been documented as very rare. We've had 25 million cases in this um, planet and counting, probably way more than that, by the way. And, you know, to have two cases of reinfection is very uh, rare. Um, there's a macaque, uh, an animal model that reinfection after you've had been infected is rare. Um, and we've been having some really exciting data recently. They're all published in the last two weeks, actually, from Cell and Nature and Cell Reports, that even with mild infection or not having symptoms at all, you can get you can get immunity. And it's not, it's importantly, it's not that antibody stuff that they talk about in the news because um, the thing about antibodies is that's not really how we fight viral infections. So what we really want to look at is cell mediated immunity or T cell immunity. Um, and we've had some very hopeful data that uh, even mild disease can lead to that immunity. And then what does that do? That slows down infection by itself because the virus is running here and there and it can't get to someone if they're immune for a short period of time. And we need to get to a vaccine, but this could give us a lot of hope while we're waiting for the vaccine. So in terms of the conclusion, I think masking has more than one advantage. It has huge advantages. I think it has three major reasons that we want to do this right now. It'll stop others from getting infected. It'll stop you from having, uh, ho hopefully getting infected. And if you do, so, um, it will reduce the severity of disease. This is a theory that's been going on for many years. It's really hopeful, but we have to wear our masks. And I would never yell at anyone for not wearing a uh, mask. I think this city more than any other city has shown um, the power of harm reduction and not, and sort of teaching and figuring out how to get people who are masked without yelling at them. Um, and I don't think that's effective at all. Um, masking has been very effective in many places as they've opened in terms of keeping the weight of severe disease down. The US may become or may be in a natural experiment. Maybe Florida, Texas, and Arizona are different places than San Francisco, Boston, and New York. Um, and if cell-mediated immunity is triggered with, with mild disease, that's really hopeful for slowing down the spread of the virus while we wait for a vaccine. We can talk about other questions about where you should be masking. And then I always like to show this um, slide because this is from 1918. And you could see this family and then the tagline would be, well, if the cat could mask, so can we. Okay, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gunn.
Jafria, I think you you are yes. up. Yes. So um, I guess um, we can do let's let's do questions through the chat. If people have questions, do you, you want to type it or or uh, raise your hand? Let us know, community. There's a question from Pratiba. Question from Pratiba. Yeah, so my question is, this is what I'm trying to get. I'm from working in Tenderloin. So are we, uh, is city saying that it would, be get, it would be good for everybody to get tested? Or are we focusing on only symptom, symptom uh, people who have symptoms to get tested? Because if we are focusing on everybody to get tested, that would be a different approach um, I would say the outreach would has to be really intensified and some of us who work in the community needs to be really supported on that, that once we do that kind of testing, then there has to be some support after the testing. So I've never gotten an answer what cities, what DPH's thought is, like, do we really need to go down that road? Because Tenderloin is number two on the list. So do we really go in Tenderloin and say, you know what, it's, since it's number two on the list, let's focus on everybody getting tested and let's get everybody tested, like how Mission did. So, uh, Dr. Fuchs, I think that's a question for you. Great, no, thanks for the question. So no, so you're, thank you. I think, no, we are not supporting universal testing as a strategy. We are supporting and we've shared and we're happy to, sh um, I can also uh, connect with you and, uh, independently, and I'm happy to share our prioritization um, for testing. There's a number of tiers. So for example, people who are hospitalized, people who are symptomatic are prioritized for testing. Um, and there are people who are essential workers based on their risk of where they work, where they live, um, or based on their care status. That would be prioritized for testing. And then as what we're calling our tier 2A, these are individuals who, based on structural barriers for care uh, and inequities, would be prioritized for testing. So the Tenderloin is a great example. It's a community, and there's several census tracts within the Tenderloin that have high rates of infection. So we would have targeted outreach to be able to try to identify individuals who may be at highest risk for, um, for, uh, for COVID. And so we'll be using a targeted strategy, and I think to build on what Dr. Gandhi was sharing is that it's not just the testing, it's the testing, it's the messaging and the prevention messaging around universal masking. And then it's also for those people who are identified as being positive that we're able to wrap around and provide support so people can safely self-isolate if they need it. So happy to answer additional questions. And Dr. Gandhi, if you have any other additional thoughts you wanna to add to that, please. I mean, I'd say that this is actually a very contagious, it's, it's, it's a contagious virus and testing everyone and you don't even know what the next day will happen. Um, I think this is the right approach, this more strategic approach to testing and prevention because you don't even want to get there. <laughs> um, and this prevention aspect is this kind of masking strategy and hand hygiene and keeping away if you can and um, in schools cohorting. I mean, there's, there's very good uh, public health strategies for prevention. Thank you. I see it's a question in the chat, and I, I also want to talk to the community, is that um, we have Dr. Gandhi on here, and so if you have questions specifically about the research that she has done um, every week, uh, Dr. Fuchs and I, we have, we, we break it down in districts. I know District 6 has some conflicting meetings, so we may have to do that differently, but we do do D10 and D11 at 1 p.m. Um, and then the mission at 2 p.m. Um, and then we'll also be adding Western Edition and um, Chinatown area. But I wanna read this. This is another Jonathan question. And then I hope community has uh, questions for Dr. Gandhi. Um, do you have the racial ethnic data for the test positives for um, from pop-ups and particularly in um, the OMI, Sunnydale, Viz Valley, Bayview. Um, I know it's Latino um, population continues to be the majority, but our, Dr. Fuchs, and we do have more expansive data when we have um, 
the Friday calls. Today, we just kind of, we didn't go through the racial et ethnic um, data this week because of Dr. Gandhi's presentation. Go ahead, yeah. Dr. Reed. Yeah, Jafria, thank you. I think you said exactly what I was gonna say. So I'm happy to provide that information. We can go to our color dashboard and to be able to get the breakdown, which I've done over the past several weeks. And so just because of the abbreviated presentation today, I wasn't able to present that, but I'm happy to share those data. So if folks are interested, my email is there and please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to provide it. I have a question, Dr. Gandhi. <laughs> is that, what, you know, I, I, when I'm in community, and I see people, one has a mask, one doesn't have a mask, right? And so many people in communities, like certain communities, is almost like you silly wearing a mask because people be like, I don't have anything. And I just want to know about the data. What it, for the person that's wearing a mask and, and talking to a person in close proximity without a mask, what does that data look like? That data looks good. I mean, I think that is actually the most empowering part of masking is that you're protecting yourself. Um, and so I find that's what I kind of mean about the 80% compliance in that model and you know how many, what percentage of the population there are gonna be in schools, for example, kids that can't mask. Um, who have special challenges. They're gonna be, um, pop, uh, we have patients upstairs in Ward 86 um, uh, with mental illness that are not able to keep on the mask and th that is gonna happen. And, um, but you are protecting yourself uh, by masking. Um, and that not only does enables you to hopefully not get the virus, but even if someone coughs directly in your face and they have lots of virus, um, it's that getting in that less of it that will make you not sick with the virus. So I think that's what's hopeful about this message. And I'm, 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 I'm actually kind of intrigued that we started out the conversation with the CDC when it said masks protect others. Um, and there was like a particular statement about protecting you because um, when, if we think about masking in the world and it's, I mean, understandably, we don't do this very often. People in like surgical suites, surgeons will protect people um, by wearing a mask from something in their, when they're getting infected. But like when we used masking in 1918, when we used masking in to a certain degree in 2009 with H1N1 uh, pandemic, there's a lot of data that masks protect you. I mean, a lot um, actually out there. So, uh, so I just find that hopeful, right? Like it gives you a sense of control. Because I think you. people have been feeling out of control a little bit with this virus, right? Like, should I go out? Should I let my parents go out? Like, should I be working? Can I not work? Like, you know, it gives you a sense of control that you're protecting yourself. That I mean, might tell my parents all the time, like, put a mask, they're 85, I say, put a mask on and go, go somewhere because I want them to, there's all the, the, the checks and balances. You, you know, there's so much risks and benefits of what we're doing right now, staying away from each other, loneliness and all of that. So it feels very protective for yourself. Thank you. Um, that is good to know. Um, Dr. Mo, I'm trying to unmute you. Do you want me to read your question or do you want to ask? Oh, no, thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Gandhi. Just a quick quest, couple quick questions. Um, so we've been hearing about um, eyes and transmission, um, and is is that you know viable from your standpoint? And the other part, it really is you know. So say you're in the office, um, and we're all masking up, but then somebody leaves my office. I take off my mask, but they've been in my office. They were masked. Am I okay? Or, you know, how does that, how does that work? Yeah, um, so both of those err on the side, uh, and I'll give you the evidence of both are okay. What I mean by that is um, it's very hard to get it through your eyes. It, it's rare. Um, and uh, there's sort of an abundance of caution that um, face shields were recommended for healthcare settings. Uh, I would use them if you're doing something like that's going to aerosol generate and even though they've been recommended for outpatient settings there's a i think that was a profound um kind of uh, abundance of caution a lot of us are using face shields why because that is not the main place that um virus enters the human body and uh so if you wanted to be perfectly inviolable yes i think you could wear a face shield and wear an n95 but there's also like this is really uncomfortable and um 
it, it's, it's really not backed up by the evidence. In terms of this, what the question that you asked about, like someone leaves your room, I'll answer that in a very simple way. I think that this kind of, that this goes back to this debate whether this virus is airborne or droplet spread, which is like you've heard a lot about, like how that's a big debate. I think actually that it's the way it spreads in the infectious disease way of thinking and epidemiologist way of thinking is droplet. But there's evidence that it can hang out in the air, but there's evidence a lot of viruses can hang out in the air. And it's probably that physical scientists and engineers and infectious disease people and epidemiologists, we have to get on the same page and even define what aerosol and droplet means. We're arguing over different definitions. Um, no, I do not think that you're at risk if someone leaves your office and you take off your mask. Um, that is, is such a tiny amount. It's, uh, it's so little that can get in. And again, um, this is not a, that's the strange part, right? Like if everyone with one viral dose got mass like died, then we would just like be all wearing what like we people wear with Ebola. This is not what this virus is. Ebola is a very deadly virus. Um, smallpox was a super deadly virus. This is not a super deadly virus. It's just that there's a bunch of people who don't get sick and there's some people who get sick. And those people who get sick can drive down the possibility of them getting sick by covering up your nose and mouth. It's, it, I feel like it's a very hopeful message. Um, next is Pratiba. I hope I said your name right. Yes, Pratiba. Sorry. So uh, my question is, so if Tenderloin is number two, I'm assuming that the city knows certain population in Tenderloin, looking at the test in Tenderloin, like this particular population is definitely vulnerable. And uh, I don't think any one of us in this call knows what that population is, uh, which population that is. And we're assuming it is um, definitely uh, Latinx population in Tenderloin. But that being said, I would like to see, and I know that we are working with Supervisor Haney's office. We have, gotten, we have now started working with a lot of community partners to figure out how to, do te how to educate. Uh, we're a little behind in the game here from Mission, but um, I wanted to know if that is the case because I have known that people have called us because we do tenants rights advocacy in the community. And so we've gotten calls from tenants, uh, Latinx tenants, tenants saying that people have been calling them for contact tracing and things like that in one particular block of Tenderon. I'm not going to say which block, but I've not seen any special game plan for that particular block if that is the case. You know, like, let's get there, let's get the testing, like as Dr. Gandhi is saying, asymptomatic, it could be, there will be a lot of people who are asymptomatic, but I understand the universal testing is not the game that city is going with, but I don't see anything more. If there is happening, then I, we are not privy to it, of course. And it would be great for us to know as community partners, there are a lot of people here from Tenderloin who works in Tenderloin who have a pulse in what's going on. We are not privy to that. And I was wondering what, what is that and how we can be a better partner in that. David, thank you for the question. I think, um, so just I'll make a couple of comments, but I would definitely uh, defer to other partners in the community branch that are working very closely with uh, Tenderloin and Tenderloin community partners around the implementation of the both testing and the prevention strategy. But I will say that you are right, actually, and in, in most, and I think, uh, uh, Jeffrey, I appreciate the comment you made before. In terms of infections right now, the Latinx population is about eight times higher likelihood of, of um, having positivity compared to all other races combined. Um, and that is holds true actually in the Tenderloin where more than 50% of infections are actually happening in, Latin, in the Latinx community. Um, so I think there is um, particularly the kind of the outreach that we're doing in the Tenderloin, I think is really important for us to make sure that it's culturally and linguistically responsive. Um, and that we have to work in close collaboration with you, not only around the testing strategies and the targeted testing, but it's around the prevention. It's what Dr. Gandhi is talking about. It's about how do we, how do we make masks accessible? How do we talk about if folks are testing positive, that they have the um, support that they need around isolation and quarantine. So um, I think it's a comprehensive strategy there and uh, we need to be focusing on the education and the outreach in order to be able to do that effectively. So if there are others on the call, um, and Jeffrey, you may want to make some additional comments here as well. Yeah, and I, and I also want community to know too, like testing is just one step, right? Uh, masking is what, what we know that will get us out of this. 
but also to note that um, contact tracing when community, um, when, when it is identified. And I was just in our data meeting and it basically said contact tracing now in the, in the Latino community is like 90%. And that is fantastic data. And a lot goes, the hats goes out to like the Latino task force and others that have done that. But in the African-American community, contact tracing is like at 73%. And so we also, um, we have Dr. Gandhi and Patricia, I seen your, I see your, your um, comments about the Excelsior. And I want to say that, uh, I'm gonna reach out to you and then we'll talk more about um, how to support you all in the Excelsior and I've been working with Monica. I'm gonna move on to another question because this is more about how DPH and other systems can support your district. But since we have uh, Dr. Gandhi for such a short time, I'm gonna ask a, a specific questions regarding her research. So I'm moving down to Dr. Mo. Um, and I, I, I'll read some of the comments because we're, I want to make sure we get everybody because we started getting an influx. Um, thank you. This from Dr. Mo. I see, I seem to hear you suggest that testing is not necessary, but I disagree as everyone is not masking and asymptomatic people are not aware that they are, um, infecting others. So Dr. Um, Dr. Gandhi. Yeah, I did not that? say testing was not necessary. I said that was one of the pillars. Um, and so masking to prevent um, social distancing, hand hygiene, um, and testing strategically is the four pillars really to try to control this pandemic. So definitely um, agree with you that asymptomatic transmission happens. People look like they're fine and they have shedding from their nose and mouth. So I completely agree with that. Gotcha. Next um, question. Um, what about being outside? I commonly see folks at restaurants, hiking, exercising without masks. How likely is it to pass the disease when we're in close proximity, like waiting, walking past each other um, when we're outside? Definitely it's worse inside than outside, which is why if you're alone and you're exercising, you can take off your mask that even the guidelines say that uh, like if you're like, you know, in your backyard or something. Um, and then, you know, the guidelines in the city have been pretty strict about masking. Um, if you're within kind of anywhere around someone and the current guidelines even says 30 feet, just because you never know when someone's going to like pass you. Um, and so the first guidelines that the city put out on April 28th said, have your mask with you. And then when they updated them uh, in May, they said, no, you know what, wear that mask. <laughs> um, and I think that's fair, uh, but it's definitely less outside because it's all that fresh air and the ventilation and things flowing past. And that's why outside restaurants are open and inside restaurants aren't. And I think that's a really fair thing to do because um, I think that is actually a question about eating is that if you're going to take off your mask, oh, there's data from UCSF that I think will be coming out in Nature Medicine that it's kind of either or, meaning stay away from each other by six feet or uh, mask, but masking is probably more um, effective. So if you're going to be uh, unmasked because you're eating, then you've got to have that distance. And that's why indoor restaurants are not um, open right now. And that's why in outside restaurants, there, are spa there is a specified spacing of tables so that you're not around anyone else's flow. Okay. Next question, Dr. Gandhi. Um, is best ways folks to disinfect or reuse both cloth masks, surgical masks, N95 masks? Yeah, so the CDC does have guidance on this. I mean, you know, the reason I do like cloth masks is because they're easier to disinfect um, because they basically wash, you know, can wash them. Um, and the evidence really shows probably a two-ply cotton mask is very effective and as effective as the surgical mask, which is two-ply. Like two-ply means you can separate it. Um, and, uh, and you can wash them uh, every two to three days. And if you wear them every day, or you can um, even wash them every day if you have the capacity to do that and hang them over a banister. Um, or uh, wash them every two to three days. And I just get a bunch of them and then just wash them 
regularly. Uh, it's harder to, there are special ways to disinfect N95 masks that hospitals have adopted. And the Boston hospitals are really good at that because they had a lot more illness, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so they had to use, they have like this machine and they put them in and they disinfect N95s. In terms of surgical masks, the recommendation is to wipe it um, front and back with a wipe and then let it air dry. But it's only gonna, it's not gonna, um, it, it, you are getting it wet, so you have to just wipe it. You can't wash this. You, know, you can't put it in a washer or wash it with soap and water. So that's why I think these are the hardest to disinfect. Okay. Um, next one from Jackie. Uh, what is the risk of transmission if you go out and eat inside a rest? Oh, you read that one, right? So next one is to clarify on Monique's question. Can you confirm that it is okay to be unmasked while alone in a closed office space in a working building? Yes, I can confirm that. That is, uh, you know, we are all infectious disease doctors on this floor because we're uh, infectious disease division and we all wear a mask in the hallway when we talk to each other. And then if we're lucky enough to have an office, uh, we come in here and we just take it off. So yeah, I work all day without a mask and then someone just popped their head in and I put on my mask. So that's that. It's very okay to take it off when you're alone. All right, and then I'll let uh, Dr. Mo ask her her questions or concerns. Okay, sorry. Um, is there a plan to start to enforce the masking because we are seeing all over the city, but especially in a lot of the outdoor, I'm going to say the more predominantly wealthier areas, people are walking around with no masks. Um, they are um, eating at tables, of course, with no masks. And they're exercising with no masks and walk and and running by people or biking by people or all of that. What is the plan to really um, in uh, work with this? Is this just more communication, more outreach, um, or do you know? Uh, I mean, I know that you're not a you're not a police enforcer, but do you have a sense? But I do have a suggestion, and I'd love to hear Jonathan as a SFTPH person on maybe plans I don't know about because I'm just exclusively at UCSF. I, I would, I, I do have a recommendation though. I have been thinking about this a lot because I'm an adherence researcher um, and I'm an HIV researcher. And I think when I think about like HIV prevention, for example, I don't think that you should, um, you, know, you couldn't enforce condoms. You can't go into someone's room and enforce condoms. It's absolutely non-enforceable. Not only is it non-enforceable, but we really, do believe in harm reduction and do believe in figuring out other ways. And, you know, this has been a long arc of HIV. It's been around since 1981 or earlier. And so now we have better ways and then we have to even have to work on that. And, um, and it's been a very harm reduction model. In terms of masking though, I will say, we don't actually have to mask for that long. Like we really don't. Um, I think that's kind of what the CDC director meant when he said that, like if we had universal compliance with masking, that we could get through it because the asymptomatic people would get immunity. If they got it through their mask, they would, uh, at least for a short period of time until we get the vaccine, they, would, um, they wouldn't pass it. I mean, there's so many advantages to masking that it's kind of an amazing strategy. And I think I would be more stringent if I were in charge of this world. I think I'd be more stringent about mask mandates. I think I would enforce them. So um, in most European countries, there's a fine if you don't mask. Uh, and they're enforced actually in every single European country. Um, uh, the other way that really helps when people, when we don't want to be that, I know San Francisco is not that, uh, and they're not very, um, you know, it, it, this hasn't been a strategy by public health, but if you don't want to do it by enforcing strategies, which would be basically negative enforcement, like fining. The other way to help increase masking, at least in workplaces is and this has been shown in like Taiwan, like they mass produce masks in March 6th. Literally, they changed all their factories to mass producers and they just handed out masks. Like you can't even go anywhere without someone handing you a mask. Like that kind of mask handing out and surgical mask I'd recommend in that case is very effective to just tell society, oh my gosh, like that's the most important thing I can do. So I really like that idea. But yeah, it'd probably be different with with mask enforcement than I would with HIV prevention. I think it's not, a, it's a shorter, we need to get through this. We're all miserable, we need to get, we need to, we need to get people to mask and get through this. 
Jack, I see the also response to that question, Dr. Mo. So Jackie, um, do you want to just say a word about um, about this compliance committee and trying to support adherence to masking? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I serve on the compliance committee and it's broken up into, um, there's an education committee, one that focuses on individuals and one that focuses on business. I'm on the business committee, compliance committee. But um, we've been addressing this for probably four weeks now and coming up with intervention ideas and countermeasures, you know, instead of just um, enforcement. And enforcement would be the last. Some counties around the Bay Area are trying to enforce and um, charge people. And people already are unemployed and you know don't have funds. So I don't think San Francisco is going to probably go in that direction. But um, there's more to come. So we should be coming out with something soon to address that. And it also for businesses that are not complying, most businesses that are open are supposed to have a health and safety plan so that their staff will not get um, COVID. You know, they're, they're given the guidance, but they might not be following the guidance or enforcing the guidance when they see their staff not wearing masks or they're not uh, enforcing social distancing. So we are looking at it both ways, but I doubt if we're going to look at making people pay as they're walking down the street without a mask in San Francisco. And I'm going to just say, me as the equity officer at CCC, I will be adamantly against that um, as just a criminal justice person uh, to do basic citizens. Um, I have a question too, and then Dr. Mo, I'll, I'll go back to you, is that I see like seniors, they like to wear the face shields opposed to masks. Um, what does that look like? Because, or, or people that can't breathe in the mask kind of bothers them and then opts for face shields. What, what, can you tell me a little bit about that too? Yeah, Dr. they're not as good. Um, they are great um, if you kind of stay away, but they have all that side open. So it is, it is definitely true that masks that cover nose and mouth are superior to just face shields alone, unfortunately. Um, but if you're kind of away from people and then it, it does provide a level of protection, but you don't, it does, you know, you're breathing out and that stuff can come off the side. So as a sole prevention measure, it's not great. Dr. It, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be in lieu of, I guess, is, is the idea of the face shields. Because one of the things too, and then I'm, 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 Dr. Mom, I'm unmuting you while I'm asking, is that we have problems with uh, face You're free, you cut out there, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, you might have a family member um, that may be living a worldly life, let's just say that. And um, they're getting um, grandparents and other fragile members that are quarantining at home. And so I'm just, just thinking in an equity type model, what can be done inside the home like to save grandma? Should, should we be telling also, um, if you have people in your house that you think are not being safe, then you should mask around them all the time in your home. Well, this is such a hard, this is hard because the home environment is really nice to just like be the place where you get to take off your mask. But on the other hand, I guess I would say, and again, I don't make policies, but if I were, if my, I live with two children um, and I have uh, 85 and 86 year old parents, and if my children were out all the time um, and I was, and I wasn't masking, that I'd probably wear a mask at home around them or have them wear a mask. So it kind of depends on the situation. Um, or, you know, again, uh, distancing is also an effective strategy. Um, people don't tend to distance though, of course, um, but uh, distancing is an effective, it's like that, what that Swiss cohort study what showed us, and there's again going to be this other model, is that it's either distancing or masking. So you may be able to say, okay, I need to stay away from you. So when I went and visited my older parents, I just, I didn't hug them and I stayed away from them. Gotcha. And Dr. Mo, you'll close us out. Go ahead. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. Um, uh, is there some new information that I have not heard? Because I heard you say that they would have a unit that we, if we did all universally mask, there's a potential to get uh, immunity. But I've been hearing that there is no immunity that lasts, um, and that's why UCSF decided not to pursue a vaccine. 
Um, is there new information? No, you see, I don't, um, I don't think anyone said not to pursue a vaccine. So I think the way to think about the immunity, and I'll just answer this really quickly because I'm so sorry, I have another call it too, but um, is that we've had 25 million cases of SARS-CoV-2 around the world and probably many, many more because we don't test you know, everyone. And um, we've had two reported cases of reinfection. That's really low, actually. Um, there are a lot of people who uh, we would be having lots and lots of reinfection because this this thing is you know out there for sure. This virus is circulating. We'd be getting lots and lots of reinfection if people don't didn't have some immunity. So they absolutely have some immunity. And then the other aspect is this kind of B cells versus T cells, which is how we think about different arms of the immune response. And viruses are controlled by T cells. And this data that's been coming out recently. Um, and also with other coronaviruses, it's really hopeful that T cells come up for a while. Will it last you your whole life? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know, but I don't think so. It didn't for these two people that we've had um, documented reinfection. It'll last you for some time. And then that's the question is, can it last until we get to a vaccine? It does make vaccines harder, but vaccines are always hard. Like you have to actually try to induce some sort of T cell, long lasting T cell response as well. It's gonna be hard. It's not gonna be like, this whole thing is not gonna be easy. But yes, it is true that you likely, in a way, few cases of reinfection in a way prove the role. We'd be getting infected all, we'd be getting massive amounts of reinfection with all this circulating virus if, uh, if it wasn't rare. It's, it's pretty rare. All right, yeah, thank you so on. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yes. Gandhi. Um, and I'm giving you a round of applause in my soul. Okay, right thank you. And I definitely don't want to charge people either. I'm just saying we got to figure out something. But I don't, of course, I don't want to charge people. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. And then community, before you all log off, because I know we're all back-to-back -back Zooms, I just want to say that I've put my information in the chat. Um, our JIC, which is the Joint Information Command Center, is doing a lot of targeted community campaigns. Um, as well as uh, ethnic and cultural campaigns. If we are not in your community um, and you don't see stuff reflecting of your community or your neighborhood and you wanna work with our JIC, feel free to email me and I will send it to Francis Zamora and Tyrone Jew. I'll put their names down too in the chat, so bear with me. Uh, thank you all. Look at Monique putting my nickname, yes, <laughs> okay. Um, but look in there, and then you can always email me. Um, I'm listening to all concerns, complaints, because we want to do right by all communities, especially our vulnerable communities. And uh, thank you, Dr. Fuchs, and the behind-the-scenes staff. You all are amazing. Um, and Jonathan, do you want to say anything else to close us out? No, I just thank you so much. Thanks to all for your attention. A lot of good questions here, and I think it's also sparking ideas. If you have ideas of other topics that you really want to make sure that we cover, for example, there are questions about vaccines and vaccine trials, we can uh, dedicate a session to that and other topics. So please let us know. But uh, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Really appreciate it. And I put their contacts uh, if you want to work on a communication campaign. This is some of the new ones that you can see from our JIC. Um, reach out to them, say, Jafria gave me your contacts, please. And then call, and you can always email me if you, if you miss it. Oh, okay, Kelvin, I'm, that's perfect. Kelvin Wu is on here and his stuff is in the chat. So reach out, reach out because we're trying to do really good work. Thanks. Thank you for joining the COVID-19 Learning Community event. For any questions or needs, please contact dph.doc.ops.community at sfdph.org.
All right. Good job, guys. That was a great meeting. Great. All right. Very Are we stop recording? <laughs>